Greetings, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Higher Ed Geek Podcast. This is episode number 30 with BJ Mendelson, uh, where we're talking digital privacy, uh, his journey becoming an author of two uh, really cool books, as well as a uh, uh, burgeoning uh, comic book author. And um, yeah, it was just really interesting exploring uh, his background um, and experience through uh, different facets of education, um, kind of finding his way. And um, yeah, just, uh, you know, I personally just finished his book on privacy, uh, really cool stuff there and uh, look forward to a review from me about that. But uh, yeah, really cool guy uh, doing some really neat stuff. And uh, just check out all the stuff that we mentioned. Uh, BJ keeps uh, pretty well read. Uh, so he's got some recommendations of what's, uh, uh, you know, kind of on his mind right now, what he's checking out. So um, yeah, just find everything we talk about in the show notes and ways to connect with BJ. And uh, yeah, after this brief message from our sponsor, this is episode number 30 with BJ Mendelson. Hey there, listeners. It's an honor to have our good friends at Swiftkick be a sponsor of the podcast because I've seen their work firsthand and it's truly unlike any student leadership training I've experienced. They've been voted best student leadership program unprecedented five times, so you know they must be doing something right. As a bonus for our listeners, Swiftkick is giving a $500 discount off their normal speaking fee if you mention Higher Ed Geek when you contact them. I highly recommend their trainings for your campus as your students will be talking about it for months afterwards. It's really great stuff. Check them out at swiftkickhq.com to learn more and let them know I sent you. Now, back to the show. Yeah, and I, uh, yeah, I'm really excited to, to talk with you. Just since I, I know when you reached out, you kind of have a an interesting origin story, um, and then I've also been uh, checking out that uh, the privacy book that you wrote. Um, oh, cool! And uh, yeah, it's been really cool. I just like appreciate your style and sort of like the kind of voice that I like to read. Um, is <laughs> just the way, yeah. Um, very, it kind of is that like doesn't take itself too seriously, but does like kind of take the subject at hand seriously. You know, just trying to be like very sure. thoughtful and all that. So. Um, yeah, it's really good stuff. So we'll definitely like, you know, link out to all your stuff and anything else that you might, um, sort of name drop in the episode. But, um, so if you want to, uh, kick us off here and just give an introduction of yourself and, uh, how you got to be, uh, where you are today. Sure. My name is BJ Mendelson. I am the author of the book, social media is bullshit and privacy and how we get it back as well as two comic books. One of them being a self-help comic and the other being an action adventure series called Vengeance Nevada. And uh, I'm also trying to complete my PhD in American history on and off over the past few years. Very cool. Um, and yeah, I guess you have um, yeah, sort of like an interesting origin of how you kind of came to everything that you uh, do now. So I guess like what were those sort of formative experiences when you were, you know, in college and kind of entering into the world and things that were very, you know, formative for you both personally and professionally? I, I think for me, you know, I... So I was one of those kids that didn't do well in high school, uh, not because of an intelligence issue, just because I just didn't care. And so uh, I got into Alfred State College only because my dad had sent in an application without me knowing. Uh, and I had told him, I'm only going to NYU and other colleges are bullshit. And so uh, went to, I went to Alfred, transferred to Potsdam. And I, I really, when I transferred to Potsdam is where all this started to gel. Uh, because I found in Potsdam what I didn't have in Alfred, which was kind of this community I connect, I can connect to through doing stuff like being a resident assistant or being part of the college radio station. Or uh, there was a public access TV studio just down the road over at Clarkson U University, WCKN. And I found like all these different opportunities I started testing and playing around with. And it's really uh, there that I was kind of like, okay, well, I don't have money. And I go to SUNY Potsdam, and nobody knows what where that is or what that is. Mm -hmm. So uh, the only thing I could do to really promote myself is the internet. And so I had to adopt pretty early on to things like Friendster and MySpace and Facebook and, and all the platforms we have today, just in the efforts of promoting the ideas that I had, promoting the you know the public access TV show that I had, the radio show, and all that. Yeah. Um, and I guess you know that was yeah all the sort of like kind of formative stuff that got you to, you know, writing your books and kind of having, yeah, more of this, this profile and something that you're kind of putting out into the world. Um, especially with, yeah, I guess like social media and privacy and all that. So, you know, I guess segue us through there and then like, what is really engaging with you on that topic? Like, what are you, what are you enjoying most about exploring these things? And, um, 
And I guess I'm curious, I guess we'll maybe <laughs> circle back to like the PhD sure. and how you see that kind of fit in. But I guess, you know, <laughs> right. much of what you do now and, you know, kind of have some notoriety for is, you know, the, the books that you've written. So like you said, you were sort of exploring these platforms and uh, putting yourself out there. When was maybe that switch where you kind of like, um, I don't know, I guess you just really kind of took a different perspective. And I appreciate sort of the, um, again, always having that sort of critical lens uh, with anything uh, that we consume or use or whatever. But um, yeah, I can, I kind of make that segue, I guess, from using the platforms just to promote yourself to then kind of examine it a little bit deeper. Oh, so yeah, it all, it all traces back to grad school. Uh, so by way of background for, for grad school, I went right into Potsdam's organizational leadership master's program. My wife at the time uh, no longer wanted to live in Potsdam. And so we moved to Albany. I switched into the PhD program at UAlbany in American history. Uh, she no longer wanted to live in Albany, and I kind of fell off the grad school map. But in my time during grad school, I realized that there was a way to look at things that I just hadn't considered before. There was a deeper uh, framework of knowledge that you can apply what I had been doing into. And so that's really when I started to dig into it past the promotional stuff. It was sort of like, okay, well, this is a degree in organizational development, and later I would try to resurrect that with a degree in higher ed administration at the University of Buffalo. And under that, I was like, okay, uh, these are all, we, we find that these there are these patterns of human behavior, and I thought maybe a lot of this stuff had been limited to the internet and marketing to them. I was kind of like, oh, well, people are irrational, and that's, that's why you have to be quick and to the point when you do something on the internet to get people's attention, but it turns out that's just a human behavior. That's how we are offline as well. Mm -hmm. and, and so once I had that perspective of, okay, uh, this is not an internet thing, or this is not something that's limited to marketing, this is a human thing, that's when I started digging into it and going, okay, well, let's look at how people interact with social media. Let's look at how people interact with privacy. And, and now, uh, the book I'm working on now is, let's see how people interact with, within the self-help sphere of things. Well, and again, just now I'm like, my brain is going off on these tangents. So, <laughs> okay. so um, good. yeah, so like the books that you're writing now are, you know, yeah, very much like just looking at a lot of different things with a critical lens. And I think that's certainly something that higher ed gives us at the very least, or I would hope so just for anybody, depending on, you know, it doesn't really matter what you, you major in, um, is just making you into a critical thinker and right. somebody who's thoughtful and all those things. But yeah, if it was sort of glossed over and it was something that I know when we uh, were talking about recording, it came up is that you do have this sort of like interrupted origin in higher ed, like you mentioned, being an RA. <laughs> right. And that was something that was an affinity in a community for you that certainly, yeah, not everybody that is an RA has to then go into higher ed, but that's a common thread where people, yes. you know, sort of find out about this, you know, kind of career, but, you know, you pursued it at least a little bit, and I guess part of it might have been life events sort of getting in the way, but I guess what made you want to pursue that in the first place, and then was there anything, I guess, that sort of, you know, for a lot of people listening, are people either kind of associated with higher ed in some way, but so I'm just really curious, I guess, what that path was like for somebody kind of like coming in and out, and it sort of was just this like blip on the radar for you in terms of your, your story, so if you can just kind of talk about that a little bit more, because I'm just really curious about it. Sure. Uh, I, I think I'm going to get the statistic wrong, but uh, when I was at the University of Buffalo, I, I believe 90% of the students that were in the higher ed program uh, were former resident assistants, myself mm -hmm. included. So I don't know if that's true across the country within the higher ed programs. I suspect that it is. Uh, and the reason why is because I think when you are a resident assistant, or at least it was true for me, it is you realize that you can help improve other people's experience while they're at college. You can help teach people things. You know, you don't have to just passively go through college. You can you can become active in the, in the actual process of not only your own education, but the people around you. And, and that's what appealed to me, at least. And when I had gotten into organizational leadership at SUNY Potsdam, uh, that, that was the reason was I was an RA for three years. I really enjoyed it. And I was like, okay, I want to continue doing this for the rest of my life. I think higher ed is is the career path for me you know at the time like the the books hadn't really they were still a few years off and so for me that was always the career path was being all right uh, and realized how wonderful that was and wanting to continue doing that professionally and then that led to organizational leadership which led to higher ed because really the programs are they're not quite the same but there, there is a heavy overlap um, particularly within the second year of the higher ed program uh, between organizational leadership and development and higher ed so 
uh, yeah, life events had interrupted me in 2008. And then uh, in 2015, so just by way, again, by way of background, I was traveling uh, all over the world between 2012 and let's say 2017, if we're being generous, and uh, living out of hotels. And I just kind of got exhausted at one point. So I decided I'm going to take myself off the road, go to UB, and uh, complete the program in you know the Masters in Higher Education Administration. And so uh, that was that was the plan for me. And then life events again <laughs> uh, got away and kind of interrupted that. Uh, actually, the only reason why that, that I didn't finish that program, to be honest, is they didn't have the last course I needed offered online. Uh, UB is one of the last holdouts in terms of getting the higher education program uh, administered online. You have to physically be there at UB uh, to complete all of the courses. And so that was the only reason why I didn't finish it. But yeah, I, I found that it was just, I, I was attracted to management and people and, and having an earnestness to helping people succeed. And so that's why the higher ed field really appealed to me. And that's, I, I think it really shaped uh, the core message of all my books, you know, cause really I'm not writing this stuff to say, ha ha, look how stupid we are. You know, I'm writing it cause I want to educate people and show them, you know, there is a right and wrong way to use these tools. And I think that that very much ties back into my experience within the higher ed coursework and, and being an RA. Uh, and yeah, I think that it's two things there, I guess. Yeah. Just like, or maybe even, even three. Yeah. One, that core of just like, yeah, you like, it's, it's the, the layer is that, yes, yeah, some people who are RAs, you know, a lot of them become people who work in higher ed, um, just through ways of like, yeah, I enjoy doing this work, whatever. But I know for me and a lot of other people too, it's that idea of where like, I got so much out of that experience. I would love to help other people to be able to make the most of their experience as well. Um, right. Whether it's just that or just kind of rolling into it or kind of um, falling into it. But um, yeah. And then um, yeah, that other thing about like uh, just that one last class that you need not being online. Like I work now, you know, much more in digital education. And I think there have been some times people where it's like, kind of hemming and hawing whether it would make sense to have and i guess i know they are out there but if they should proliferate um in terms of like online uh like higher ed degrees because i think people assume that you would have to be on ground you'd have to be like you know really ingrained in that but if you are like a, a working professional who does want to just get that credential to, to further your career you know i think there's a, there's more like in the edd and phd and sort of educational leadership and that sort of thing but i don't know maybe that's not what everyone wants to do. They just want to get that kind of professional, um, you know, credential in terms of just like a master's. But um, so, yeah. And then I think the last point, yeah, that resonates with me all the time that I say is like, you know, yeah, like you write in a way that I enjoy uh, where it's sort of this, you know, sardonic, you know, kind of uh, way about yourself. But I think people do assume, yeah, you are just sort of like pointing out something. It's like, oh, that's that's wrong and that's dumb. I don't know why people do that. It's like, no, you're being witty and being sort of critical, but because you care about the result, you'd want to help people. You want you know everything to kind of improve. So, um, yeah, it's just uh, interesting that way where, yeah, some people can be, kind of be dismissive because of the delivery, but um, sure. sort of the heart of it, you know, is, is genuine and kind of, uh, you know, wanting things to improve and get better. Um but, uh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're, you know, you're writing a lot and you're doing, um, you know, comics and stuff. So I guess talk more about that, about just kind of like what you're geeking out about currently, if it is just sort of that professional work that you're doing or just sort of the other stuff personally that you're into. And if it's like stuff that you've discovered or have always been into, um, just kind of, I guess, paint that picture of what's kind of capturing your attention right now. Sure. So, I mean, I come from a family of educators, uh, my, my dad, uh, my ex-wife, my aunts and my uncles, my brothers and sisters are all uh, teachers, most of them in public school uh, throughout New York City. And so for me, uh, the comics really evolved from a form of, OK, I, I know that I'm, I'm funny and can entertain and inform people, but I wonder if there's a better way uh, to convey certain information to people using pictures. And, and that was also something that came out of the higher education program at Buffalo, where we talked a lot about how you communicate with, with uh, 18 and 19 year olds today that are starting school, as opposed to kids like me who, you know, we had the internet, but it really wasn't a thing back in 2000, 2001. You know, we, we had it, but it wasn't like, oh my God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live off of this thing. You know, mm -hmm. I'm going to spend all my time on it. Uh, so a lot of the discussion revolved around, okay, well, using pictures and using visuals to get people to learn. And so I got one of the things that I did, I didn't mention was I was tutoring 
members of UB's football team. Uh, they have a Division One program in the MAC conference. And so I found in tutoring some of those students that when I gave them a visual uh, to explain something, they, they got it. You know, there was no question uh, as opposed to me trying to lecture and discuss. And so that's really what led to the comics in the first place was, okay, if you're going to do something like self-help, which, you know, it's one of the oldest professions. A lot of people will argue with you that, that the Bible is a self-help book. And then later, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, you had Andrew Carnegie and the book Self-Help, which came out in the late, I think, in the 1880s or 1890s, which started a genre. Uh, but being able to do that in picture format and using that as a way to get people to learn faster and and actually incorporate what they're learning, I think, was what, you know, that's why I geek out about is, can I teach people in a way that's not only fun, but in a way that they're they're also going to kind of get and keep for the rest of their life? Because I, I feel I didn't necessarily have that growing up, and so that's that's stuff I get excited about. Is definitely comic books and of course pro wrestling, but uh, that, that's a tangent for another time, probably. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, and it's interesting because yeah, I remember um, just the pro wrestling thing. A brief uh, aside is like yeah, like I remember being into that when I was younger then I just sort of like fell off of it. But then I, and now I know so many people that are kind of like generally in my age range that like kept with it or rediscovered it and stuff. So it's just, it's, it's nice. Yeah. Just to see that kind of persist and stuff. But um, yeah. And I guess, yeah, it's neat just now where I think, yeah, we're in a place where we recognize and appreciate kind of the diversity of learning styles and um, just ways that we can engage people um, in topics that might be like, oh, they would never get it or they never understand, you know, whatever. But it's like, no, you can just serve it up in a different way and it can be, um, yeah, just like way more engaging and relevant and um, just create better outcomes and not just like do everything one way to hundreds of people um, or just like lecture at them or anything like that. Um, so, um, yeah, that's really cool that that's something that you're kind of engaging deeply with. But, um and I guess, yeah, another question is like, how has those things like that you do, you know, writing and all that, maybe if there's any anecdote of somebody like coming up to you or, you know, just leaving a comment or something about, uh, uh, you know, the books that you've written and all that, like all this stuff that you've pushed out into the world, you know, how have those kind of positively contributed to your life? Obviously, they've helped a lot of people. Um, and, uh, that's sort of obviously like the, the goal and everything, but like, has it kind of come back to you in terms of people sharing th that impact with you or just kind of how it's kind of changed and shaped your life and your focus and how you want to kind of go about things? Yeah. I mean, I generally operate uh, each time a new product or you know, a book or comic comes out. I just assume that no one's going to read it. <laughs> uh, so it always helps uh, when, you know, when people do come and they're like, Oh yeah, I, I read social media's bullshit three years ago and it, you know, it changed my approach to marketing. I've got that a lot. I've got a lot of kids. Uh, that, that book in particular was really popular in college marketing programs, uh, unexpectedly, because that wasn't initially the target when we had put out the book. But there's a lot of students, because it's going on five, six years now. So there's a lot of students who might have read the book in, in class and then went on to work at like an old movie and matter uh, that I've heard from. And they've been like, oh, yeah, I run things completely differently because I read your book in, in my um, freshman marketing class or whatever it was. So I think that's really what what's affected me the most. And what, I, what I've what i taken away from is that people actually do read read this stuff uh, and share it and, uh, you know, disseminate it among each other, which I think is is really I mean, it sounds obvious, but it's kind of great for an author to know because most books don't sell more than 300 copies uh, over the course of their lifetime. If they're lucky, you know, most uh, you have kind of like this weird curve where, you know, at the top end, you've got like, you know, Stephen King and James Patterson. And then there's this big trough, right, where all the rest of the authors kind of reside. And you're lucky if you could sell more than 3000 copies, whereas you got like a Stephen King that sold millions of copies. And so uh, it's very easy to believe that no one no one is reading your stuff. But that was a big takeaway. The other thing was that I had stupidly thought a lot of the social media stuff was was an American issue. Mm hmm. And it wasn't until I traveled overseas and was, you know, made appearances in the United Kingdom and in Russia where everyone sort of had the same story of believing one way about the stuff to be true. And then uh, my book kind of coming in and them going, oh, well, these are things I thought, but, you know, I felt like I was alone. And now I, I'm not alone anymore because I've got this book and I can kind of challenge the conventional wisdom. So that was that was pretty great as well. Very cool. Um yeah, and that's neat. Yeah, that it's like being, 
you know, has been like incorporated into curriculums and stuff. Cause yeah, it's like, I know sometimes it's, it's good to have a, um, it's sort of, again, it's like, it's not saying like social media should not exist or something. It's like, it needs to right. exist in a different way or whatever, but this like, yeah, like having kind of that contrarian, um, point of view where it's not just like oh this is just a textbook that explains what social media is it's like yeah maybe you have that but then you have you know all these other kind of like different views of how you um would utilize the different the different tools and stuff so that's that's cool um yeah i think it, it's sort of that like sort of middle ground of like humility where yeah like obviously like just to like sort of not get into your head too much it's like yeah you know write things and assume you know no one will read it kind of thing so that you're not obviously like two in your head and then uh anybody who does it's great but that, so it's like not being too hard or too easy on yourself kind of thing i guess it's like that you know yeah people have said great things so it's like oh wow people are really benefiting from the things i do so i'll, I'll take it seriously enough but i'm not gonna like get my ego you know all inflated but also be like you know what yeah my books are not like yeah stephen king millions of people whatever so it's like let me just do my thing put my unique voice out into the world and the people that it resonates with, it will be genuine and pure. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess now I'm curious, um, maybe things that like help to inspire your writing or just the things that you um, kind of engage with for fun. Like, what are you reading? What are you watching? What are you listening to right now? And like stuff maybe we can, uh, you know, include in the show notes. Oh yeah. So I, uh, I'm kind of ridiculous in terms of my reading. Uh, I'm looking at my desk right now. So I'm reading, I, I tend to read four or five books at once. Uh, which is kind of ridiculous, but I'll read off a couple of them real quick. One is Team Arrivals. Uh, one is God is Disappointed. I think it's, yeah, God is Disappointed in You, which is like a graphic novel version of the Bible uh, where they took out all like the religious texts that it's mostly just jokes, but the jokes are, inac it's still an accurate like telling of the Bible, uh, which for me as an atheist, I thought I should, you know, I should have a working knowledge of this. So uh, that was perfect for me. So uh, I have habeas data, uh, affluence without abundance and then the last one is uh the art of dramatic writing so yeah i i read a lot <laughs> it's sort of uh the answer to that question and, and i found in reading a variety because that's a pretty decent variety mm -hmm. of topics that i found in doing that that that's where i'm able to kind of draw these connections that other people haven't thought of and that's really what informs my writing is being able to connect, kind of connect the dots. And, and that was the same deal with social media's bullshit where uh, you're right. I wasn't saying, you know, you know social media is bad or the platforms are bad. But I, I was coming at it from this, this different angle. Of, you know, there's a, there's a different way to think about this stuff than what we talk about on the news or what, you know, or what the marketers are selling us. So that's, uh, yeah, that's sort of a big thing. I, I try not to watch a lot of TV. Uh, as you might imagine, when you're reading four or five books at once, you really don't have a lot of time for tv so i think the only thing i watch consistently are like uh youtube clips of like the daily show and seth meyers and colbert where it's you know i, I get the monologue but i don't need to sit through like the the celebrity chit chat yeah um yeah i feel like that's what i usually do as well it's just like like uh, whether it's the skits or yeah the monologue or something it's just like like the interviews are always just so like stilted and just like not i don't know it's usually not anything interesting but um when I guess that I'm curious with, with as much reading as you do, because it's something that I've not ever explored as much as I love like podcasts. Do you uh, consume any of your books in audiobook form or are you just always like hard copy or do you read them on like a digital like e-reader? Oh, it's all in print. Uh, I have, so I have Audible. I'm actually listening to uh, the Charles Duhigg book about habits, uh, The Power of Habit. I don't count that uh, as part of my reading though. That's more like if I'm working on something, it's in the background. Uh, if I'm going through a spreadsheet for somebody, for example, I, so I don't count that as part of like the four or five books. That's just more uh, like a fun kind of thing. Cause I'm not, com I don't look at it as being as completely engrossed in it as I would be with some of the other books where, you know, I am listening, but I, at the same time, I don't think I'm processing it the way, cause when I read it in print, I'm always taking notes, you know, I'm dog marking pages, I'm underlining things. So I'm very active in terms of what I'm consuming. Whereas with the audiobooks, I love them. And uh, they're like a constant companion for me, but I, I, I still don't count those as like reading book. I, to me, it's more like just a fun activity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I'm just not a prolific reader. And uh, so I'm always just curious how people do it because it seems like people, I don't know, I guess like the trend maybe, and I guess <laughs> certainly people can correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah, it seems like the people who do consume a lot of books, it's always hard copy. And maybe it is that idea where it's really just like 
kind of undivided attention because of like often I'll kind of breeze through stuff on um, my iPad, but it is easy to just be like, oh, well, hold on. Let me, like, I just got a message in or just got an email or something like, and uh, kind of popping out and popping back in. But um, yeah, so that's, that's very, uh, very impressive to me as someone who like (laughs) at best uh, maybe reads like one book a month, but you know, try to read up on like different like articles and stuff online and all that. So I think uh, it's certainly just always good to be a, uh, you know, healthy reader and yeah, just like a, a good diverse diet of uh, different stuff. Cause yeah, I definitely consume a lot more podcasts and they're pretty varied. So it does help to, you know, like provide that inspiration and everything, which is, uh, which is really nice. So um, cool. We'll, uh, we'll link out to those books uh, in the show notes here. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, I'm curious, uh, you know, we'll wrap up here as we always do. I'm curious what you would have to say here, but uh you know, just for kind of where you are now, um, you know, ending on this sort of optimistic note, what is something or things that you are uh, looking forward to in your job, life, and or the world? So uh, I'm a big believer. It, this is not an original idea, so don't <laughs> don't credit it to me. But uh, I'm a big believer that you should plan your decades. Uh, and so, you know, the last decade was, two, let's say, 2008 to this year, which was just getting established and. Uh, putting out books and content and getting getting people to know who I am and and what to expect from the content I put out as well as kind of finding my voice and so uh, the the next ten years are about all about the comics uh, in terms of like being someone within the industry someone that you know could write for Marvel feasibly or someone that could make a movie out of some of the property that I work on so uh, that's you know I, I think it's good to have a plan and I think it's good to not be in such a rush that's why I said plan your decade as opposed to like you know, next year I'm going to publish 300 comics, uh, which is often what you get where people kind of want it now and they don't realize that this stuff takes a lot of time. And so for me, you know, I, I have it very clearly mapped as to, all right, well, right now I'm, t- I'm writing two books at the same time. And by the end of the year, they, they, if I keep at a pace of uh, two pages and, you know, alternating between books every other day, I should reasonably be finished by, let's say, this time next year. Uh, so, you know, that'll keep me on task to sending it out to an agent and then going through all those motions. So I, I have it broken down on like a really granular level. And that, that's not to say that like every day I do the same thing. I think sometimes that scares people when, when you talk about like having like this general plan. Um, you know, like I'll every day could be different. But as long as I check something off the list, however it gets done, it gets done. And that's that's sort of what I work towards. And I found that just to be really helpful in life to, to know where you're going and uh, it's real, sort of relaxing because then you, we get so easily overwhelmed about the future. We're very bad as as a species about predicting what's going to happen tomorrow, let alone like a year from now. But I, I found having a kind of this general outline to follow is is uh, a stress reliever, which is important for me because I have OCD, um, but also just something that provides a lot of clarity and focus on your work and, and helps you decide uh, what to work on and why you're working on it. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Cool. Um, well, I guess I'm curious as like a follow up because I'm sure many people might be interested because I guess, correct me if I'm wrong, I guess you're, you're very much kind of a, you know, solo entrepreneur, like you're kind of just doing your own thing, right? That's right. Yeah, it's uh, I have I have all the, you know, I got an agent, I have a manager, but I don't actively use them. Uh, you know, I self I self publish the comic books, I self published the audio edition to the privacy book, uh, the privacy book and social media is bullshit came out through publishers. But yeah, I try to uh, part of it's because I have OCD. I, I try to do everything on my own because um, I found that that's just how I'm wired. But I, I really do try to accomplish as much as I can on my own, not, not only for that reason, but because I, I think it's more rewarding to actually learn how the comic industry works. And, oh, this is this is Diamond, and this is how you get into Diamond. This is how they distribute the books across the country, and this is how the whole business model. Like, I'm just fascinated to learn new things. And so doing things on my own really allows me to do that where I can I can learn the entire industry uh, and kind of challenge myself and see you know I can really test and see if I'm applying the knowledge correctly whereas if I if I had you know someone else to lean on I'm not really getting that education Mm -hmm. well I guess in addition to kind of you know the the kind of two points that you had there just like because I think that it's definitely valuable is yeah making sure that you at least have some kind of working functional knowledge about all the aspects that it takes to be, you know, sort of doing your own thing and, kind of, you know, blazing your own trail and kind of balancing, I guess, like, you know, each day getting stuff done, but then also not putting the pressure on yourself to, you know, uh, have these sort of like unreachable, unsustainable goals. 
Um, I guess, again, just because I'm sure some folks are interested, like any other last piece of advice just on your, that, that kind of journey that you've been on of, you know, doing things on your own and maybe how it worked out to kind of get it started. Cause I think that's maybe where most people, um, struggle. Um, cause I think some of those things that you mentioned would kind of be the sustaining parts, but, um, mm-hmm. so like when you just started out, like any advice that you might have, just like a quick little nugget that might, uh, help some folks along. Yeah. Uh, so just, just a quick story. When I was 18, I wanted to be a stand-up comedian, mm-hmm. uh, but I was too young to perform in bars. And so I figured out that if I rented out the bar, I could do my own show. Uh, so what I would do is I would, I would work with bands. The bands would pre-sell the tickets. They would keep all that money. And then I would get the stage time. Uh, and, and I was doing that since I was 18. And so when people look at the voice I have now in the books, it, it all comes back to that. It all goes back to uh, me just learning, okay, well, if I can't do it this way, there's another way to do it. And then figuring out kind of a little business model around that and testing the idea and saying, okay, I'm going to give myself a a year to see if I'm funny. I don't mean like I think I'm funny. I mean like objectively, can I make different audiences laugh? And if I can, then I will stick with this. So, uh, I mean, it sounds reductive to say just do it and just try it. But I I, I had no one telling me you should go and do this. It was just I figured it out on my own that I can book these bars and and do stand-up. And then I just stuck with it once I, I tested and validated the idea. So I think being able to just try whatever you would like, but test and validate it as you do is the most important thing. Cause I think a lot of people don't do that. Like I can think of my sister who is a terrible writer, but uh, continues to write to this day because she doesn't validate her or, or test her stuff at all. She just sort of puts it out there uh, where I'm constantly going, okay, here's a product. Let's see how people react to it. And if they react strongly to it, I will continue working on it and, and show up every day and put in the work. And uh, it takes time and, and you really don't know until you actually do it. So uh, do it, but also test and, and see how it's doing. Oh. Yeah. Really good stuff there. Um, and yeah, I think that's kind of been my experience as well. <laughs> just sometimes like where there's a will, there's a way. And even if you are kind of hitting some barriers, you can sort of, you know, spin around and kind of get around them and, uh, kind of persevere. And also just, yeah, like kind of validating your ideas with people who would theoretically be engaging with them, even if it's just kind of like spitballing or like, yeah, let me put this thing in front of you. What do you think of it? Um, so yeah, really good stuff and uh, awesome. Yeah, I mean, I really appreciate your time and all that you shared. And uh, yeah, we'll have ways to kind of find the the work that you've done. Uh, we'll put that down in the show notes. But um, yeah, just thanks so much. And uh, yeah, just have a great uh, great rest of your day. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. This podcast is a proud member of the Connect Edu Podcast Network, bringing together diverse voices and thoughtful discussions to the higher ed community. Check us out online at connectedu.network or on Twitter at Connected You Pod. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the podcast. Please rate, review, and subscribe so you'll never miss an episode. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you in the next episode of the Higher Ed Geek Podcast.